Hello, welcome to the Friday, May 8th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording, well, from Jacksonville, Florida, of course. I always tell people if there's a tool that you're using a lot for many, many years, it doesn't hurt to look at the man page once every so often or whatever documentation is available. Case in point, we got a diary today from Boyan about all these NSE scripts that are coming with Nmap. When I grew up, well, Nmap was a port scanning tool, but it has really become more and more sort of a full-fledged vulnerability scanner, and Boyan is going over some of the more useful NSE scripts that are included in Nmap. In the past, we had sometimes Manuel write about some of these scripts, but certainly worthwhile to revisit Nmap and check out what scripts are available. And of course, the number is steadily growing. And Apple apparently fixed a three-year-old sandbox escape vulnerability in the latest beta of iOS, which will eventually be released as iOS 13.5. Couple details were released today by Siguza, who originally discovered this vulnerability about three years ago, and it's a pretty kind of interesting in a way how simple this sandbox escape is vulnerability. The core of the problem is that Apple uses four different XML parsers as part of iOS and configuration files for apps are stored in property lists or plist files, which are formatted in XML. Now, these property lists include all kinds of entitlements that a particular application possesses and due to the bug in the XML parser, comments aren't parsed correctly or at least differently by uh, two different XML parsers. So an attacker would create an XML file, sign it properly, but the important entitlement, in this case, it would be com apple private security no container that allows the software to escape from the sandbox would only be visible in one of these parsers and ignored in the other parsers. So all currently released versions of iOS are vulnerable. This will hopefully be fixed soon with the release of iOS 13.5. I kind of actually expected 13.5 to be released this week. Well, uh, maybe next week it will finally come out. And of course, someone decided to call today, Thursday, the World Password Day. And the sort of overwhelming sentiment of uh, what I've seen sort of written about it today is that we really should be done with passwords. And I want to highlight sort of two things here. Microsoft has a real sort of nice quick blog post about passwordless authentication and makes sort of a business case for it. Microsoft in this blog post states that currently 150 million Microsoft customers are using passwordless authentication each month. Now, they sort of have a graph that shows a pretty steep increase, but no real scale to the graph. So a little bit hard uh, to make sense of it. But uh, certainly, overall, passwordless authentication has a real important role to play here. And earlier this week, Tails, the privacy-focused Linux distribution, released a new version, version 4.6. And as part of this update, they are now adding support for Universal Second Factor or U2F. And now this, these are USB security keys. While not no password, uh, passwordless, they are at least uh, fairly decent accepted standard for second factor authentication. So nice to see this in a privacy focused uh, Linux distribution. And Cisco today and yesterday released a long list of patches patching various vulnerabilities. If you're running Cisco equipment, certainly pay attention. There's probably something in there for you. The one vulnerability I want to highlight here a little bit is a problem with uh, Cisco's adaptive security appliance or ASA software. It could allow, as it says here, an unauthenticated remote attacker to impersonate the Kerberos key distribution center. 
So this essentially allows an attacker to bypass authentication on affected devices that use Kerberos for authentication for VPN or local device access. So completely remotely exploitable. In particular, the VPN aspect here may be a problem for people because that's not what you're blocking sort of remote access to because after all, you want to connect to the VPN to then make additional changes to your network. Also, you not only need to apply a patch to fix this vulnerability, you also need to apply a configuration change. So read the entire bulletin from Cisco. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.